presentation of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. you to turn with me to the second chapter of First Corinthians. The second chapter of First Corinthians. How many of you have your Bibles? Lift them up. Wonderful. My, look at the Bibles. Hold them there a moment. We've been asking people to bring their Bibles every night. And so bring a Bible. Tonight I want you to turn to First Corinthians, the second chapter, and the second verse. The Apostle Paul is speaking in his letter to the Corinthians these words. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. And he says, while I was in your midst, there was only one thing that I knew, and that was Christ and Him crucified. He said, it's the secret, the basis, the foundation of all my preaching and teaching, Christ and Him crucified. And then I want you to turn with me to Galatians, the sixth chapter and the 14th verse. Galatians, the sixth chapter and the 14th verse. But God forbid, that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Here the Apostle Paul is saying, God forbid that I should glory in anything except the cross, the suffering, the agony, the death of Jesus Christ as he died for our sins on the cross. Now why did Paul say that? Why do you see a cross on every Catholic church? Why do you see a cross on every Protestant church or somewhere in every Protestant church? Why has the cross become the symbol of Christianity? Have you ever thought about that? That's the one thing that all Christians agree on. I'm sorry to say that all Christians do not agree on everything. But all Christians agree on one thing. There is one thing that every Christian Catholic or Protestant agrees on, and that is that the cross of Jesus Christ is central in the Christian religion. Now, Paul could have gloried in other things. He could have gloried in the pre-existence of Christ, because before the foundations of the world were ever laid, Jesus Christ existed. He could have gloried in the birth of Christ, because the birth of Jesus Christ is the most supernatural act upon the pages of human history, because he was virgin born. He could have gloried in the teaching of Christ. Even our great teachers today say that he was the greatest teacher of all time. He could have gloried in the miracles of Christ. He made the blind to see, and the deaf to hear, and the dumb to speak, and the lame to walk, and the dead to rise. He could have gloried in the power of Christ, because from flaming fingertips he flung worlds into space. He could have gloried in the resurrection of Christ because the Bible teaches that on the third day he rose again. He could have gloried in the coming again of Christ because the Bible teaches that Christ is coming again. But he didn't say that. He said, I only glory in one thing, and that is the death, the suffering, the agony of Christ as he died on the cross. Now, why did Paul say that? Why would thousands of Christians all over the world rise up and say, I agree with Paul. I agree that the central theme of Christianity is Christ and him crucified. Why glory in a man's death? That has never happened in history before. Why glory in the execution of a man on a cross? Why glory in the shedding of blood on the cross, a Roman cross? An American tourist 
was being shown about Palestine once, and his Arab guide was showing him from one interesting spot to another. And finally, the American tourist said, show us Calvary. Why, it's Calvary that makes all other places seem interesting. And when you come to the Bible, you'll never understand the Bible unless you understand that central in the Old and New Testament is the cross of Jesus Christ. You'll certainly never understand the Old Testament. The Old Testament with all of its sacrifices that were only types of the day that Messiah was to die and be cut off. You will never understand it until you understand that the very heart of this book is the cross of Jesus Christ. From Genesis to Revelation, there is a crimson thread, and that thread has to do with the suffering on the cross that day at Calvary. Well, what does the cross teach us? The cross of Christ teaches us several things. The cross of Christ, first of all, is an expression of human iniquity. When I see Jesus Christ dying on the cross, I see an expression of sin. I see all the sins of the world piled up in one pile and laid upon Jesus Christ. Now, if you come to the Bible, you'll find that one-third of Matthew and Mark are given to the death of Christ. One-fourth of Luke, one-half of John is given to the death of Christ. And all the way through the ministry of Jesus Christ, he taught that he must die. He said the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many. And every time you partake of the Lord's Supper, every time you take of communion, you are remembering that Jesus Christ died. The wine shows forth his blood that was shed. The bread shows forth his body, his flesh that was mutilated for our sins on the cross. And if you come to the theme, the epistles, the theme of the epistles, you will find all the way through expressions like this. We have redemption through his blood. We are reconciled to God through the death of his son. He is the propitiation of our sin. He is the lamb that was slain. All the way through the Bible, you will find the story of the death of Christ. And every time I see it, I see that it's connected with sin. Now, the Bible teaches that the death of Christ was voluntary. He said, no man taketh my life from me. I lay it down myself of his own free will. He gave himself because the moment he was born in Bethlehem's manger, he came to die. All the way through his life, there was the shadow of the cross. Jesus Christ was not killed. Jesus Christ was not killed by any particular group. He was not killed by the Romans. He was not killed by the Israelites. Jesus Christ died on the cross of his own volition. He didn't have to be killed. He didn't have to die. He died of his own volition. And it was your sins and my sins that nailed him there. And when I look at the cross, I see that there must be something wrong with men and women if God had to send his son to die for sin. Sin must be black. Sin must be terrible. Sin must be awful. If Jesus Christ the beloved Son of God, the jewel of heaven, had to die for our sins. Yes, the Bible teaches that all of us are sinners, and you had a part in the death of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that when you break the Ten Commandments, that is a sin. The Bible says when you fail to live up to the Sermon on the Mount, that is a sin. And then if you have not lived up to the great law in which Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, and strength, and thy neighbor as thyself, then the Bible says you're a sinner, you're a come shorter, you're a transgressor, and every one of us are sinners tonight. And because of our sin, because we are sinners, we are doomed. We are doomed to eternal banishment from the presence of God. Because sin separates God from man. Sin brings about a penalty. The penalty of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. The soul that sinneth shall die, the Bible says. But Jesus Christ, the Son of God, said, I will die in their place. I'll take their hell. I'll take their judgment. I'll take their death. I'll go to the cross. And when I see the cross, and the blood that is being shed there, I see the sins of us all on Jesus dying for us. Look at the sins that put him there. 
they weren't the big sins that we normally call terrible sins. They were the little sins, so-called. Little to us, but big in God's sight. They were the little common everyday sins. Look at Caiaphas. The sin of Caiaphas was that he was self-seeking. He was the great high priest. He had self-interest. He was so full of self that there was no room for Christ. He was proud, and that helped nail Jesus Christ to the cross. And tonight there's some of you just as proud as he was, just as filled with your own selfishness, and the Bible says we crucify him afresh. And pride keeps more people from the kingdom of God than any single sin. And you cannot come to Jesus, cannot come to the cross with pride. The Bible says a prerequisite for coming to the cross is repentance, and that means an emptying of yourself, a willingness to turn from your own selfishness and your own sins. The basis of all sin is self, selfishness. That's the reason Jesus said, if you come after me, you'll have to deny self and take up a cross and follow me. You must deny self. How many of us tonight are filled with our own selfishness? Everything is centered on self every time we get angry. Most of the time when we get angry, it's selfishness. Jealousy has its root in selfishness. All of our sins can be put their roots down into selfishness. How filled with self. I want my way. I'm going my way. I'm going to live my life. I want this. I, I, I. And if you take the word sin, S-I-N, the middle letter is I. Take the word pride, P-R-I-D-E, the middle is I. Take the word Lucifer, the middle is I. I, I, ego, egocentric, centered in self. Now, when you come to Jesus Christ, it means that he must have first place. He must be Lord and Master. When you come to him, you must make him the master of your life. He must have the preeminent place. He must be first. And then look at the sin of Pilate. Pilate was a coward. Pilate was afraid. He was afraid of what people would think if he didn't allow Jesus to be crucified. And there are many of you that are crucifying Jesus Christ afresh and you're refusing to give your life to him because you're afraid of what your friends and your neighbors will think. You're afraid. You're a coward. You're afraid to stand up for Christ. You're afraid of what it's going to cost you to give your life to Christ. You're afraid of some sneering business associate, some sneering classmate. You're afraid that you won't be quite as popular. You're afraid that you'll be considered old-fashioned, puritanic, too much religion. And so, just like Pilate, you take your stand and deny Christ and do not give your life to Christ. And the Bible says we crucify him afresh. And I want to make it quite clear that when you come to Jesus Christ, there are certain groups that you may move in that it will be unpopular to live a Christian life, to live a clean, wholesome life for Christ. But I want to tell you this, they'll respect you. They might snicker a little bit. They might make a couple offhand remarks. But they will respect you for living for Christ. I've heard the world talk about a man that lives for God. And when they're in trouble, they'll come to you. And then look at Herod. The sin of Herod was the impurity of his life. He was living in adultery. He was living with his brother's wife. And John the Baptist had pointed at him and told him what a sinner he was. And Jesus had also denounced that sin. And because of the moral sins in his life, he could not take his stand for Christ. And immorality robbed you of the ability to respond to the challenge of Christ. It dulls the senses, it blinds the eyes, it solidifies the heart, it paralyzes the will. And the Bible says you can commit it three ways. By a look, by a thought, by a deed. And there are hundreds of you tonight that cannot take your stand for Christ because of immorality in your imagination, immorality in your heart, immorality in your acts. And as a result, it's keeping you from Christ. I beg of you tonight to renounce your sin and come to Jesus. Come to him and let him wash that sin away. Come to him and let him wipe the slate clean and make you a new person. Look at the sin of Judas. The sin of Judas was greed. That's the sin of many of you tonight, greed. 
He was ready to sell his moral character for a few pieces of silver. I talked to a man tonight. I said, are you coming to the meeting? Oh, he said, I'd love to. I said, are you coming? He said, well, I can't. I said, why? He said, well, he said, I've got to earn a living. I said, you can park your tax income for an hour and a half. He said, no. He said, bread is more important, I guess, than God with me. How true that is of thousands of us. We've sold our souls. We're ready to sell our souls for a few pieces of silver. You're ready to sell your soul by being dishonest in order to get a better job. You've lied, you've cheated to get where you are. Selling your soul to get a better salary. Selling your soul in order to get a few more dollars from the government that you know that you owe the government by law. Selling your soul. How many a woman has sold her body and her soul for a few coins? How many men have sold their souls for a few dollars? Greed, avarice. Ah, but wait a minute. You're not guilty of that, you say. But some of you people who claim to be Christians and go to church, you are selling your spiritual life, you are selling your soul by not tithing to the work of the Lord and to the church. You've been robbing God of offerings and tithes. And it's a sin in the sight of God. And you've sold your soul. You're robbing God. You can rob your next door neighbor. Rob the man next to you. Rob your business associate. But I warn you, for God's sake, don't rob God. How many Christians profess to be Christians and they go and they say, Lord, I love you. Oh, how I love Jesus. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds to my ear. And on Sunday morning you sing it so sweetly and during the week you rob him of that which belongs to him. And you nail put another nail in his cross and crucify him afresh. That was the sin of Judas. And then there was another sin that so many hundreds of you are guilty of. It was the sin of indifference. Sitting down, they watched him there. And that is actually a greater sin than antagonism and belligerence. The Bible says, Thou art neither hot nor cold, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Not taking a stand, being neutral about Christ. I want to tell you tonight, the Bible says you cannot be neutral about Jesus Christ. You have to make up your mind what you're going to do with Christ. You say, no, Billy, I'm going to be neutral, but Jesus said you cannot be neutral. Jesus said you have to decide, one way or the other, what you're going to do with Christ. You cannot serve God and man. It's one or the other. If you are not serving God, then you're serving the flesh. If you haven't given your soul to Jesus Christ, then you've given it to the devil. It's one of the two. Which are you? Jesus made it quite clear that there are two roads, the broad road and the narrow road. He made it quite clear that there are two masters, God or self. He made it quite clear that there are two destinies, hell or heaven. One of them is yours. You have to decide. And some of you are going to have to decide tonight. This is your moment of decision. This is your moment of opportunity. Sitting down, they watched him there. How many tonight are helping to crucify Christ again? He was crucified by the ordinary, everyday sins that we all commit. And there are many here tonight that are guilty of these same sins. In the crowd, there are men like Caiaphas, who will let self-interest keep them from standing up for Christ. There are men like Pilate, who quake with fear and dread at the criticism of the crowd. There are others like Herod who are shut away from Christ by the mar bars of moral filth. There are others that deny him and betray him. They crucify the Son of God afresh and they put him to open shame. Yes, when I see Jesus Christ dying on that cross, I see the sins of Billy Graham nailing him there. And I bow with tears streaming down my cheeks and I say, my God and my Lord, my Christ, I have helped nail you to that cross. I have helped crucify you afresh. And every time I sin, it hurts the heart of Christ. And I'm just as guilty as a Roman soldier that was pounding the nail into his flesh. I see him there. He says, I thirst. I thirst. 
letting us know the intense physical pain that he was going through. But I hear him say something else. I hear him say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And in that mysterious holy moment that we hardly dare even discuss or talk about, I see God in a mysterious, wonderful way laying on him the sins of us all. I see Jesus Christ bearing voluntarily my sins on the cross. What a glorious thing to know that he was willing to take our place. He was willing to die on the cross. He was willing to give himself. I thank God that he stayed there. Then he bowed his head. His head didn't fall because he, didn't, he wasn't killed, you see. Jesus Christ voluntarily gave up his life. He was not killed actually by the nails. He was not killed actually by the spike in his feet. He gave up the ghost voluntarily. And he bowed his head and said, it's finished. Now, when he bowed his head, that means that his head had been erect. And he bowed it quietly, deliberately, reverently, and died. And in that moment of death, he grappled with hell. He grappled with judgment. He grappled with sin. He grappled with death. And he defeated them in that glorious moment when he died on the cross. But the Bible says we crucify him afresh by the sins we commit. But I see something else in that cross as I look and as I gaze at it. I see in that cross the expression of the great love of God for man. I read in a magazine the other day the love story of a man and a woman, and it said it's the world's greatest love story. I disagree. The greatest love story ever told is the story of God's love for man. Man created in the image of God, the object of God's everlasting and eternal love. Think of it, in spite of the fact that we're sinners, in spite of the fact that we've denied him, in spite of the fact that we're crucifying him afresh, in spite of the fact that we've done things against him, in spite of the fact that we've wandered away and rebelled against God, the Bible says God loves us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In Deuteronomy 7, 8, the Bible says the Lord loves you. In Deuteronomy 23, 5, the Bible says the Lord thy God turned the curse into a blessing unto thee because the Lord thy God loved thee. In Psalm 146, 8, the Bible says, The Lord loveth the righteous. Isaiah 38, 17, the Bible says, Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption, for thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. Malachi 1, 2 says, I have loved you, saith the Lord. John 16, 27 says, The Lord himself loveth you. Ephesians 2, 4 says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins. I tell you tonight, God loves you. And when I see the cross, I see the love of God outpoured. I heard about a girl some years ago down in Texas during the days of the old carriages. And she was sitting in the carriage and the horses were running away. And a man was standing on the street and it happened to be her fiance. He rushed out and grabbed the horses and in doing so, he stopped the horses, but he fell under and was crushed and he was dying. And she leaned over him. And as he was going out of this life, he said, Mary, I loved you, didn't I? From the cross, God says to you and me, I loved you, didn't I? I gave my son. I love you. Oh, I want to tell you such love. Such glorious, majestic, splendid love such love that he gave his son to die on the cross should compel every one of you to get up out of your seat and come to this cross tonight and receive him as your Lord and Savior. How you can turn your back on him. How you can reject him. How you can say no to him. To such love as that is beyond anything that I can possibly understand. But I know that there were several years that I rejected him. There were several years that I turned my back on him until one day I saw him on that cross as it were and I said, my Lord and my God, I receive thee. I beg of you tonight, do not crucify him afresh by turning your back on him. 
You come and give your life to him and say, Oh, Lord God, I receive thee, I follow thee, I will serve thee, because thou didst die in my stead on the cross. Such love has God outpoured, but I want to tell you, the worst of all sins and the tragic sin of all is the sin of rejecting love. Rejecting love. Some of you love someone, but they don't love you. You know what a terrible sin that is. How it crushes you when God has poured out his love for you and given his son for you, and then you reject it. There is no other sacrifice for sin. There is no other way. There is no other means of salvation. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. His own self bear our sins on the tree. And for us to reject it, to turn it down, to say no, to neglect him, crucify him afresh, reject love. When God offers you a pardon for your sins, he offers you forgiveness for every sin that you've ever committed, and then you reject it. You turn it down. You say no. What a tragedy. And when you turn down the pardon of God, there is no other way of salvation, the Bible says. Jesus said, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Have you believed in the Son that was lifted up? Have you received him? Are you sure that your sins are forgiven? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The Bible says there is none other name under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. There is no other way except by the way of that cross. I want to tell you something. If there had been another way of salvation, Jesus would have never died on the cross. On the night that he was betrayed, the night before he died, he knelt in the Garden of Gethsemane and he said, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. What was he praying? He was saying, oh God, if it is possible to save Billy Graham, if it is possible to save Bill and Jim and Susie and the human race, if it is possible any other way, if they can work their way to heaven, if they can buy their way to heaven, if there is any other way, oh God, spare me the cross tomorrow. But the answer, as it were, came back from heaven. There is no other way. Man cannot be saved by bread alone. Man cannot be saved by earning his way, by working his way. For by grace are ye saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There is only one way that men can get to heaven, one road. Jesus said it was a narrow road. He said the gate was narrow. And it's the cross, and I must come to his cross. That's the reason that one-third of Matthew, one-third of Mark, that's the reason that one-half of John is given over to the death of Jesus Christ in Hayes' Life of Lincoln. There are 5,000 pages, and Lincoln was dramatically assassinated, but there are only 25 pages given to his death. Yet in the biographies of Jesus Christ, from a third to a half are given to his death. Why? Because it's the only way to heaven. It is the only way to get forgiveness of sin. And if you haven't come by faith to the foot of that cross renouncing your sins, I don't care who you are or what you are, you'll never be in heaven. You might be a member of some church. You might live a good, decent life, and all of that is fine. But your sins are not forgiven, and you're not going to heaven unless you've come by the way of that cross. Have you come by the way of that cross yet? And that brings us to the last point, the challenge of the cross. You can do three things tonight with what I'm saying, with Christ. You can reject him. Some of you will. I hope you won't. But always in an audience like this, some will walk out deliberately rejecting the love of God in Christ, crucifying him afresh. Others will neglect him. And to neglect him is the same as to reject. Sit in your seat and say, I'm not going to do anything about it. I'm going to be neutral. I'm not going to make a decision. I'm not going to surrender myself. I'm not going to give myself to Christ. Thirdly, you can accept him and receive him. You say, but Billy, I've always believed in Jesus. I've always believed in God. I've always believed in the church. I've always believed in the Bible. Have you? Oh, yes. Intellectually, you have. I agree. 
The Bible says the devils believe and tremble. They do more than you do. They tremble over their faith and they believe, but they're not saved. It's more than that. It means surrender, commitment. It means that I receive by an act of the will, by an act of faith, I receive Jesus Christ who died on the cross and rose again for my sins. Have you received him by a definite act of faith? If you haven't, receive him today. You might have taken confirmation. You might have been confirmed. You might have partaken of the ordinances or the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. But I'm asking you this. Have you definitely, by an act of faith, received Christ? If you haven't, do it tonight. And when you come to the communion table the next time, it will mean everything else to you that it doesn't mean now. It'll be the most precious moment that you've ever spent when you come at the Lord's table. But there's something else to the challenge of the cross. Jesus said, if you come after me, you'll have to bear your cross. What did he mean by that? He meant that you'd have to bear his reproach. The Bible talks about the offense of the cross, the unpopularity of the cross. It means that you become a witness for Christ in your community. It means that you become a witness for Christ in your area. I took a tour of some of the areas of New York City this week that need better housing. And I thought to myself, if I were a Christian, if I were a Christian, I'd take a stand in this community to try to get better housing for these people. That's bearing your cross for Christ in your community. We have today racial tension in the United States. Bearing our witness is working toward better race relations. It means also that we're willing to take our part in society as a witness for Jesus Christ. Christ called you to him, but he sends you back into the world to live as a shining witness, to bear your cross, even if it means unpopularity. Taking your stand for him at every turn. Lenin once said that a communist is a dead man on furlough. Christ demands no less. He demands that you share his cross. Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. Never again do I live, but Christ living in me. It means that you become a Christian witness. You bear the cross in personal ethics, honesty, integrity, loving your neighbor. It means a witness in the home by being the right kind of a father, the right kind of a mother, the right kind of a son, the right kind of a daughter. It means a witness in the fellowship of the church. It means faithfulness and loyalty in the church where Christ is preached. That's what cross-bearing means. The challenge of the cross to follow Christ as they followed Christ in the olden days in the crusades with the cross going before. I call upon you tonight to follow Christ, to come to his cross, to renounce your sins, to receive him. And let us move forward as redeemed, blood-bought children of God until we see a mighty victory in this country for Jesus Christ and his church. I'm calling on you young people and older people alike to come and give your life to Christ no matter how hard it may be, how difficult it may be, whatever price you have to pay. And here's the way we're going to do it. I'm going to ask all of you in your seats all over this place to get up and come and stand right here in front. If you're with friends and relatives, they'll wait on you. I'm going to ask you to come from everywhere. Men, women, young people. From up in the balconies, you say it's a long way down there. Yes, I know. But Jesus went to the cross in your place. Certainly you can come a few steps and give your life to him. I'm going to ask you to come from everywhere. You may be a member of the church. You may not be a member of any church. I don't know who you are or what you are. You can come, and while these people come, you can receive Christ. Right there in your home, you can say yes to Jesus Christ, and your life can be transformed and changed. I'm going to ask all of you to come, and while you're coming quietly and reverently and standing here, I'm going to ask you to stand here a moment. We're going to have a moment of prayer and a verse of Scripture and say a word to all of you together before you go. If you're in a delegation, they'll wait. If you're with friends and relatives, they'll wait on you. You can go back and join them after a while. But don't you turn away from Christ tonight. You come and receive him into your heart and say yes to him.
from all over, up here, all around. You come right now, quickly. Just get up out of your seat and come. And while you come, the choir's going to sing, just as I am without one plea. Oh, Lamb of God, I come. You say that just as you are. You don't have to understand it all. You may never understand all about it. All you have to understand is that you need Christ. That's all you have to understand. You just come just as you are and say, I come and give myself to the Savior tonight. We're going to wait on you. There's plenty of time. You come right now, quickly. This has been a presentation of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association.